Hello and welcome to Winning Paths Podcast, your guide through the exhilarating world of archery. Whether you're a seasoned archer or just dipping your toes into the sport, this podcast is your go-to resource for everything archery related. Our podcast is a bi-weekly rendezvous with fresh episodes dropping every Sunday. We are thrilled to take you on a journey exploring the rich tapestry of archery, from its storied past to the cutting edge present and even glimpses into its exciting future. Winning Paths isn't just about the sport, it's a celebration of the passion and dedication that fuels the archery community. Join us for riveting monologues and insightful interviews, covering a spectrum of archery topics. From the historical roots that anchor our beloved sport to in-depth equipment reviews, we've got it all. Expect fascinating tidbits, little-known facts, and explorations of archery's role in historical and sociological contexts. In essence, it's your one-stop shop for all things archery and beyond. Your participation is crucial to the heartbeat of winning paths. If you have suggestions, insights, or a burning desire to share your own archery journey, we want to hear from you. Connect with us at tfm.news and become a part of shaping the podcast's future. At Winning Paths, we're on a mission to continually enhance your listening experience. We value your feedback and are dedicated to delivering maximum value to our community of archery enthusiasts. So, buckle up, stay tuned, and immerse yourself in the world of winning paths, where the pursuit of excellence in archery knows no bounds. Welcome to another episode of Winning Paths. In our Unstrung Virtue series today, we explore the historical tale of St. Crispin's Day in 1415. Join us as we navigate the strategic intricacies of the Battle of Agincourt, revealing the clash of power and wealth in medieval Europe. No Shakespearean musings here, just a deep dive into Henry Fears' foray into France, showcasing a story not of chivalrous heroism, but of tactical complexity. In the aftermath of Agincourt, witness the decimation of French nobility and the ripple effects through history, from diplomatic maneuvers to the Treaty of Troy. Get ready for a cerebral adventure through time, guided by historical scrutiny and the pursuit of truth. Welcome to Winning Paths, where history unveils its secrets with every step. Have you beheld the cinematic masterpiece titled The King? If not, it is imperative to rectify this omission promptly. The production exudes an exquisite ambiance of historical epochs, coupled with commendable performances an amalgamation that satiates the discerning viewer's appetite. Granted, one may engage in nitpicking over the historical fidelity of characters, locales, and events. Some may scrutinize minutiae such as inaccuracies in armaments or period-specific attire, yet such concerns seem trivial when juxtaposed against the overall enjoyment derived from the cinematic experience. Regrettably, this discourse shall not delve into a cinematic critique or an analysis of the actor's performances. Instead, it aspires to regale the reader with an intricate narrative surrounding the Battle of Agincourt, as portrayed in the film, hence the thematic association. Acknowledging the historical proclivities of many readers, a more fitting categorization might be, with a historical inclination, an endeavor shall be made to present the most equitable rendition amid the myriad interpretations of these historical events. So, settle into your seats, fasten your seat belts, as we embark on a riveting expedition into the annals of yesteryears. On the auspicious date of 25th October, in the year of our Lord 1415, the Kingdom of France suffered a catastrophic defeat at the hands of the youthful and zealous monarch of England, Henry V. Continuing the legacy of his predecessors, the newly anointed king of the Lancaster dynasty waged war in France to reaffirm his claim to the throne of this realm. He earned notoriety as a scourge to the French at the grisly Battle of Agincourt, a conflict still steeped in controversy, commencing with the words of the Bard of Avon, who wrote, From this day to the end of the world, but we in it shall be remembered, we few, we happy few, and extending to venerable historians and self-taught scholars of historical lore, the collective gaze envisions, 
or rather yearns to perceive, within the brutal tapestry of the Middle Ages, an epoch of terror interwoven with unparalleled heroism, a testament to fortitude transcending temporal bounds. For he today that sheds his blood with me shall be my brother, be he ne'er so vile, this day shall gentle his condition, and gentlemen in England now abed shall think themselves accursed they were not here. Despite the poetic allure of these sentiments, the historical veracity of Shakespeare's prose remains questionable. The young king's expedition bore little resemblance to a quest for justice and heroism. Rather, it more closely resembled what historian Mike Lodes astutely characterized as land piracy. Lodes posits that Henry V's foray into France constituted a pursuit to augment his coffers by asserting a tenuous claim to the French crown and annexing territories that would yield taxable revenues. In essence, it amounted to a private royal venture wherein a cohort of individuals, motivated by pecuniary gains, joined the monarch in seizing additional wealth. Thus, a critical examination of this enterprise reveals the precariousness of its nobility Contrary to the idealized portrayals by Shakespeare, Laurence Olivier, and subsequent adherents of such depictions, the Normandy expedition led by Henry V marked the resurgence of the third phase of the Hundred Years' War, dormant since the Peace of Bretigny in 1360. In this campaign, Henry not only secured a pivotal port and established a strategic foothold in Normandy and Aquitaine, but also achieved a remarkable victory against the vastly superior forces of the opposing kingdom. The Battle of Agincourt stands as a pivotal moment where the English monarch decisively dismantled the armed wing of the Armagnacs, took numerous prisoners, and came close to concluding the war with a triumph. However, Henry narrowly fell short of attaining the long-standing objective of English kings, ascension to the French crown, and de facto dominance over France. A critical juncture in the Hundred Years' War unfolded between 1415 and 1453, during which the Kingdom of France, mired in internal strife, teetered on the brink of defeat, almost succumbing to the rule of the reigning King of England, who ascended to power in late 1413. An extensive diplomatic offensive against the Armaniac coalition a pro-French faction representing the royal government was swiftly orchestrated upon Henry's succession. This initiative encompassed intelligence operations in Paris, propaganda efforts, and an alliance with the Burgundian faction led by John the Fearless, Duke of Burgundy, Count of Nevers, Artois, and Flanders. Additionally, the English monarch asserted claims to the French crown previously renounced by Edward III, demanded the restitution of Plantagenet lands, and sought marriage to the king's daughter. Henry V initiated preparations for the offensive as early as mid-1413, undertaking logistical arrangements, recruitment drives, and fortifying garrisons on the Scottish border, in Wales and at Calais. Following the proclamation of demands on the French, the mobilization of forces at Southampton was ordered, culminating in a successful landing at the mouth of the Seine on August 13, 1415. The English army, numbering 8,000 to 9,000, promptly besieged the port of Harfleur, slated to serve as a launching point for the advance into Normandy and Aquitaine. Notably, the composition of English forces featured an unprecedented deployment of approximately 7,000 archers, complementing the 1,500 men-at-arms. Despite the town's sparse garrison, Harfleur succumbed only on September 22nd, after a protracted siege exceeding a month. The demoralized English forces, beset by dysentery and subject to frequent raids by nearby French contingents, prompted a mandated 20-day respite by the English king. On October 8th, leaving a modest garrison at Harfleur, Henry V embarked for Calais with an army of approximately 6,000 and meager provisions. In response to the English seizure of the coastal town, the French convened a convention at Rouen, attended by the King of France, the Duke of Aquitaine, and numerous nobles. Following deliberations, 
it was unanimously agreed, albeit with dissenting voices from a select few dignitaries, that pursuit of the English army was imperative. This decision prompted an expeditious mobilization, resulting in an estimated French force on the eve of the impending battle, numbering in the tens of thousands, predominantly comprising men-at-arms. Meanwhile, Henry's forces, navigating the northeast coastline, encountered obstacles at the Somme crossing, compelling a deviation into enemy territory to locate an alternative passage, eventually discovering one near the town of Nesle. Pursued by the French, Henry proceeded directly towards Calais, and on the evening of October 23rd, fatigued, ailing, and laden with spoils, the English encamped near Agincourt and Tramacourt, anticipating the unfolding actions of the increasingly augmenting enemy. Estimations of the forces on both sides prior to the battle exhibit variance among scholars. While the French army is generally assessed as numerically superior, with estimates ranging from 20,000 to 30,000 men, recent research posits a reduction to as low as 12,000. Conversely, Henry's forces are approximated between 6,000 and 9,000. Contemporary scholars, exemplified by Anne Curry, assert the theory that the English were marginally outnumbered by the French. Taking into account the troops Henry deployed in France, the number on the battlefield likely exceeded 6,000. The siege of Harfleur resulted in a substantial depletion of the English forces, exacerbated by prevalent illness in the camp, necessitating the repatriation of soldiers. Additionally, a garrison was mandated in the captured town, ostensibly to ensure its secure retention. Notwithstanding, the Armaniac army, led by Charles d'Albret, who presided over a war council comprised of high-ranking nobles, eclipsed the English forces both in numerical strength and superior armament. The preeminence of knights, constituting a substantial portion of the Armaniac forces, contrasted with the English, whose knightly contingent numbered no more than 500. The strategic positioning of this knightly cohort within Henry's centre remains uncertain. Nonetheless, it is imperative to acknowledge the prevailing influence of infantry recruited from the common ranks on medieval battlefields. In accordance with historical conjecture, it is plausible to posit that the affluent French knights, constituting the forefront of the advancing banners, were extensively clad in robust armaments, featuring superior plating designed to withstand the impact of edged weapons such as swords or maces, as well as to deflect projectile threats like arrows. Notably, these knights favoured the utilisation of bassinets equipped with a distinctive dog snout cover, a vestige of the evolving trends in armour during the concluding quarter of the 14th century. Transitioning into the subsequent century, bassinet faces assumed a more rounded contour, and the neck protection collar yielded to an additional breastplate-mounted plate, commonly identified as the bivore. Conversely, the English archers, comprising the predominant contingent of the invading forces, were predominantly drawn from urban or rural communities, and thus lacked access to armour commensurate with knightly standards. Their defensive attire likely consisted of characteristic light infantry protective gear, combining chain mail with quilted leather, occasionally incorporating plate-like limb coverings. Helmets devoid of facial screens, such as the open-wing variety, facilitated unimpeded aiming and enhanced ventilation. A marked disparity in armour quality between the French knights and English archers is discernible. Both contingents, encompassing dismounted knights and infantry, wielded blunt instruments or pole arms, including war hammers, halberds, maces, etc., endowed with the capacity to breach armor integrity or inflict sufficient damage to incapacitate adversaries in battle, either through structural impairment or internal injuries. The requirement to manipulate such weapons with both hands precipitated the abandonment of shields. The diminishing necessity for shields also mirrored advancements in protective gear, which afforded substantial coverage against projectile weaponry. The confrontation unfolded in the early hours of St. Crispin's Day, with opposing forces positioned across a freshly ploughed field. 
Unfavorably for the heavily armored French, torrential rains had transfigured the terrain into a morass, presenting an additional impediment to their maneuverability. The serendipitous softening of the field exacerbated the challenges faced by the heavily armored French knights in navigating the quagmire. The precise disposition of the conflicting forces at the Battle of Agincourt remains an enduring historical enigma. A somewhat simplified reconstruction, derived from available historical sources, posits that the English positioned themselves to the south of the villages of Agincourt and Tramacourt, situated amid wooded areas and orchards or agricultural estates affiliated with Agincourt. In contrast, the French orchestrated a formidable formation to the north of their adversary, with an approximate separation of one kilometer between the two armies. This strategic arrangement endowed the English with the advantage of leveraging natural obstacles to shield their flanks, thereby thwarting the prospect of a devastating flanking maneuver, an imperative consideration given the vulnerability of Henry's army in an open, nightly confrontation. Conversely, for the army under the command of Charles d'Albray, this constrained isthmus, coupled with terrain unsuitable for the deployment of heavy cavalry, presented a perilous predicament. The limited access to the enemy's formation essentially translated to a perilous encumbrance, as the French would be unable to fully deploy their ranks. An alternative hypothesis posits a southwest shift of the entire battlefield, challenging the traditional location due to a dearth of archaeological evidence. According to this proposition, the English would have aligned their flanks against the woods of Tramacourt and the present-day Bucamps or its proximal surroundings. However, the viability of such an extensive front for Henry's contingent, numbering between 6,000 and 8,000 soldiers, appears dubious, particularly in the face of the overwhelming numerical superiority of the adversary. The counter-argument contends that the French, dispersed between Candlers and Avondans, would have had ample space to arrange their forces, potentially altering the trajectory of history. This version, however, faces contradiction from battlefield accounts, describing the confusion ensuing from successive waves of French assailants colliding with one another. The vast expanse of the battlefield, theoretically permitting facile maneuvering of retreating troops in unobstructed western directions, encounters practical challenges, as the tumultuous nature of battle often begets unforeseen and unpredictable outcomes. Charles d'Albray, ostensibly disinclined to initiate hostilities, acquiesced to the persuasive arguments presented by the War Council. The proposed battle strategy encompassed a collaborative effort involving diverse troop types contingent upon the selected hypothesis of which there are numerous, primarily diverging in minutia, such as troop deployment destinations or formation arrangements. The initial phase of the engagement entailed the deployment of light infantry and crossbowmen tasked with engaging the English archers, while cavalry units would execute flanking maneuvers. Simultaneously, dismounted knights were to be directed against the English centre. These forces were envisioned to be mobilised in three distinct waves, with the first consisting of 8,000 cavalry, 1,500 crossbowmen, and 4,000 infantry, followed by two subsequent waves of identical composition. Recent scholarly investigations, however, suggest significant exaggerations in the numerical strength of the initial and second cavalry banners, with the majority of knights assuming an infantry role. Only two select groups were designated to assault the English flanks, thereby disrupting the archer stratification. Henry's War Council, discerning no strategic advantage in awaiting Dalbrit's larger and better equipped army, made the tactical decision to advance, notwithstanding the extant challenges of dysentery-induced exhaustion and scarcity of provisions. The English king issued the command to advance the troops to a bowshot distance. When the leading echelon of the English formation approached approximately 350 meters from the adversary, archers implanted spiked wooden stakes in front of them, fortuitously constituting an efficacious impediment against the oncoming French cavalry. Enguerrand de Monstrelet chronicled, 
the English archers, of whom there were at least 13,000, discharged the rain of arrows with all their might, as high as possible, so that they would not lose their effectiveness. Although this numerical estimate is likely inflated, the volley of arrows from longbows served its intended purpose, instigating confusion within the enemy ranks and rendering a coordinated attack implausible. An intriguing aspect arises not from the numerical attribution, but from the observation of the arrow salvo trajectory, contradicting contemporary depictions, illustrating Agincourt archers firing volleys almost horizontally or perpendicularly to the advancing French. In response to the relentless arrow onslaught, the French deployed the Genoese crossbowmen, whose valiant efforts resulted in their decimation after launching several salvos. Retreating from the battlefield, they maneuvered amidst unprepared knights, exacerbating the complexities of their subsequent formation. This maneuver further impeded the cohesion of the French forces, contributing to the unfolding dynamics of the engagement. Subsequently, the inaugural wave orchestrated a direct assault, targeting the English archers across a marshy, freshly plowed expanse. The cavalry advance, however, succumbed to the relentless barrage of English arrows. Despite the efficacy of plate armors in shielding knights, a substantial toll was exacted upon squires and less heavily armored combatants. Mounts, overwhelmed by the tumult, collapsed upon their riders, adding to the chaos. To compound the calamity, those who managed to approach the English forces found themselves ensnared by the spiked barricade artfully erected by the archers, resulting in gruesome fatalities or precipitous dismounting, rendering them vulnerable to the blades of enemy axes. The ensuing bedlam transformed the battlefield into a quagmire of blood and mud. Confronted with this catastrophic turn of events, the French, bereft of momentum upon engaging the English line, encountered additional impediments, possibly exacerbated by interactions with their own infantry against whom they inadvertently clashed, creating difficulties in pushing back the troops stationed in the centre. In the subsequent interval, the second surge commenced its advance, with a disorderly assembly of knights still lingering in the foreground. The troops under Dalbret struggled to muster momentum, resulting in inadvertent trampling amid the congested ranks. The densely packed knights, unable to align themselves, were compelled to confront the English forces in a confined formation, proving impractical in execution. Meanwhile, as the French forces faced rout and a significant portion of their army remained unprepared for a charge, a smaller detachment led by Robinet de Bournouville, accompanied by a local knight, perhaps in a guiding capacity, and a contingent of 600 soldiers, supported by local peasantry, undertook the looting of the English camp near the village of Maisoncelle. Apprised of this incursion, King Henry V, apprehensive of a potential attack on the rear of his fatigued forces, deployed a measured response. As some of his troops safeguarded a considerable number of captives, thereby depleting the primary force, Henry sanctioned their disposal by assigning one squire and two hundred archers to address the situation. The perceived peril emanating from a substantial assembly of captives prompted the strategic intervention, given their potential to instigate renewed hostilities at an opportune moment. The ensuing massacre, however, was curtailed at a certain juncture, evidenced by the transport of over a thousand detainees back to England by the triumphant king following the conclusion of his successful campaign. It is imperative to acknowledge that, within the contextual milieu of that era, the act of executing captives, while not unprecedented, bore a nuanced ethical perspective. Historical records, notably the Battle of Aljubarota, attest to comparable measures implemented by John of Portugal. Such practices, though divergent from contemporary ethical norms, were recurrent occurrences, as medieval sensibilities approached the matter with distinct moral considerations. Notably, it was rare for knights to perpetrate lethal acts against their peers, as warfare served as a lucrative pretext for self-enrichment, and captives from affluent lineages 
were typically ransomed at exorbitant prices. At approximately four o'clock in the afternoon, hostilities ceased, marking the culmination of a pivotal engagement where the English monarch emerged triumphant over a formidable Armaniac army, thereby decisively incapacitating the French governmental forces. The fields of Agincourt bore witness to the demise of an estimated 11,000 French combatants on that fateful day. The illustrious Jean Boussicaut, commander of the second wave, succumbed to captivity, meeting his demise several years later in England. Charles d'Albret and the Duke of Brabant met their untimely demise during the gruesome massacre of prisoners. The toll on France was profound, resulting in the loss of all royal governors of the North, bailiff, numerous high-ranking officials, 1,560 knights, five counts, and 90 barons, a veritable decimation, tantamount to the forfeiture of half the country's nobility. Undeniably, the Battle of Agincourt stands as the most severe setback for France in the protracted and eventful Hundred Years' War. Urgency compelled the Burgundians to promptly assail the remnants of the Armaniac forces, ultimately triggering a revolt in Paris in 1418. The deftly fomented public animosity culminated in a massacre, the roots of which can be traced to the pivotal clash of 1415. This conflict significantly contributed to the financial ruin of numerous French families, compelling them to liquidate generational wealth to secure the release of kin held in English captivity. Here, I turn to the afforestated Enguerrand de Monstrelet and his chronicle, a repository from which I've culled compelling quotations elucidating the preparations and the unfolding tableau of the battle. Circa 1400 to 1453, inadvertently interesting figure emerges as a French chronicler and esteemed dignitary. His masterwork, The Chronicles, Chronique, in the mellifluous cadence of French, unfolds a narrative of bygone eras, stretching from the year 1400 to 1444. Within its pages, Monstrelet bequeaths a treasury of sagacious reflections, shedding light on the intricate dance of political and martial forces. Particularly, his insights resonate through the latter stages of the Hundred Years' War, casting shadows of consequence across the realms of England and France. In the year of our Lord 1436 and thereafter, he assumed the esteemed mantle of Lieutenant of the Gavinier, Guardian of Ecclesiastical Dues, at Cambrai. This city, it appeared, wove itself into the fabric of his quotidian existence, as he also undertook the role of bailiff of the cathedral chapter, eventually ascending to the esteemed position of provost in Cambrai. Amidst the hushed corridors of his hearth, he bore the mantle of a family man, leaving behind progeny as his mortal journey waned. The enigmatic contours of Monstrelet's life remain veiled, except for a fleeting interlude in history. He bore witness not to the enthralling capture of Joan of Arc, but found himself ensconced in her subsequent interrogation, artfully choreographed by Philip the Good, Duke of Burgundy. In emulation of Foissart, Monstrelet embarked on the literary odyssey of penning a chronique, a magnum opus spanning two tomes, unveiling the parchment of time from 1400 to 1444. Yet, the annals of another scribe, Mathieu Descouchy, whisper that his quill fell silent beyond this temporal boundary. Within the parchment-bound tapestry of Monstrelet's chronique, one stumbles upon his reflections on the epochal battle of Tannenberg, Grunwald, in 1410. This clash, a grandiloquent ballet between the Teutonic Order and the Polish-Lithuanian and Allied forces, witnessed his discerning judgment on the King of Poland. Monstrelet asserted that the monarch had recently feigned conversion to Christianity, a mere ruse to secure the coveted Polish crown. Yet, in the age-old tradition of medieval craftsmanship, a cumbersome sequel, stretching into the year 1516, was haphazardly assembled from sundry chronicles and appended to his magnum opus. Monstrelet's own narratives an odyssey into the latter acts of the Hundred Years' War, stand as beacons of archival richness, replete with authentic documents 
and the cadence of eloquent speeches. However, the artistry of the chronicler, though lucid, lacks the enchanting alchemy of storytelling, rendering his work a somber tapestry. Despite his grandiloquent avowals of impartiality, a subtle bias surfaces, a palpable penchant for the Burgundians in their tumultuous tussle with the realms of France. Amongst the manifold editions of the Chronique, notable renditions include those meticulously crafted by J. A. Bouchon in 1826 and the assiduously curated edition by M. Douai d'Arc for the Société de Histoire de France, Paris, 1857-1862. For those who seek a more profound plunge into the historical font, the opus of Auguste Molinier, Les Sources de Histoire de France, unfolds across volumes 4 and 5 and Paris, 1904. While Monstrelet's Chronicle is an important historical source, it's important to note that chroniclers of this period often presented events with a degree of bias, depending on their allegiance or the interests of their patrons. As with any historical source, readers should approach Monstrelet's Chronicle critically, considering the context in which it was written. Now, compiled are extracts from the Chronicle arranged according to the chronological timeline. In the year of our Lord 1415, on the second day of the month of August, Henry, by the grace of God, King of England and France, accompanied by a very large number of armed men and archers, landed at the port of Harfleur in Normandy. The English had passed the night in great discomfort from the excessive cold, without any refreshment, for there was not a village or house near the spot where they had taken their stand. They had made large fires in their front to warm themselves, and had drunk some wine, but their chief reliance was on God and their own good arms. The king, accompanied by his army, marched from Harfleur, and as he proceeded, he burnt all the towns, villages and castles which he passed, and advanced towards the town of Calais. The French, on the contrary, had good quarters, and had made good cheer. They were, however, more uneasy than the English, for they had not their proper leaders to command them, as you shall hear. The French, especially the princes, were armed at all points, having their helmets, with the visors down, and lances in their hands. The trumpet now sounded for the onset, and each man rushed to the combat. The archers, who were in the front, advanced with hammers and axes to break the spears of the enemy, but they were strongly met by the French, who drove them back, upon which the archers, having nothing else to do, set upon the French with their swords, and manfully defended themselves. The English, seeing the French dispositions, and that they were preparing to attack them, were in high spirits, and each man made ready for the combat according to his station. The archers placed themselves in the front, and having planted their stakes in front of them, to break the force of the enemy's charge, they waited the event with calmness. The battle then began very fiercely, and continued for a long time doubtful. Many gallant deeds of arms were performed on each side, and many were the dead and the wounded. At length, however, the English gained the upper hand and conquered all before them. As the French advanced, they sounded trumpets and clarions and made a most gallant appearance, but the ground was very disadvantageous to them, for there were many hedges and ditches which impeded their progress. The archers of England, seeing the French thus advance, retired in a body behind the men-at-arms without drawing an arrow or saying a word. They were remonstrated with by the Earl of Oxford, who asked them why they did not shoot. "'Aye, sir,' replied one of the archers. "'We will shoot when we please. You have no business to order us.' The engagement now became very severe and murderous. Many knights and squires were there struck down and slain, and many an excellent deed of arms performed. On the other hand, the archers and others, who were on the eminence, shot with so much force that the arrows entered the plates of armour and pierced through the men-at-arms, so that they were forced to raise their beavers to see out. King Henry was in the thickest of the battle and performed wonders. He was armed with a battle-axe, with which he fought and defended himself. He had that day four horses killed under him and covered with his arms and legs as many as two others might have done. But by his gallantry and prowess he escaped without injury. 
the English sword in hand and without lances, made great slaughter among French. Several of the French nobility and others were killed in spite of their helmets, and great numbers were made prisoners. The English, having obtained the victory, pursued the enemy, slaying all they overtook, and especially the common people. The King of England and his two brothers, the Dukes of Clarence and Gloucester, made the most strenuous exertions to prevent the effusion of more blood. But those who had not been at the battle paid no attention to their commands. The French had now retired a little to reform their line, for they were as much scattered as if they had never before been in order of battle. The English, seeing their line in disorder, and that they were preparing to renew the combat, acted with more caution than before. The English had shown themselves good and gallant soldiers during the battle, and the French, even those of the best families, behaved ill. The principal leaders of the French were either slain or made prisoners, and the commonalty were killed or taken in great numbers. In the wake of the victory at Agincourt, a myriad of popular folk songs emerged, with the most notable being the Agincourt Carol, composed in the first half of the 15th century. Deo gratia sanglia, re de provitoria. Deo gratia sanglia, re de provitoria. Deo gratia sanglia, re de provitoria. Post the sovereign France's defeat in 1416, John the Fearless unilaterally acknowledged Henry V as the rightful king, exacerbating the kingdom's predicaments. Subsequent diplomatic negotiations ensued between the warring factions, with mediation involving Sigismund of Luxembourg and the then Polish king Władysław Jagiełło. As historian Edward Potkowski delineates, their council impelled the English king toward a peace accord. A new treaty was expeditiously concluded in Troyes, where Henry V was recognized as the heir to the French crown and betrothed to Catherine de Valois, Charles VI's daughter. Simultaneously, the legitimacy of the King of France's son was nullified, thereby excluding him from the line of succession. All territorial gains amassed by the English during the Hundred Years' War were confirmed and bestowed upon the reigning dynasty in England. While ostensibly concluding the war and ostensibly subduing France, the Treaty of Troyes, true to the capricious nature of history, unfolded unforeseen developments. A mere two years after the treaty's ratification, Henry V passed away, followed shortly by the demise of Charles VI, the subsequent emergence of Joan of Arc, and the liberation of Orleans in 1429 shifted the tides of war in favour of the French. Charles VII, previously disinherited Dauphin, self-croned in the Reims Cathedral, a city reclaimed under the guidance of the Virgin of Orléans. In 1435, peace was brokered with Burgundy, and several decades later, the English finally withdrew from the continental theatre of conflict. And so, dear listeners, we gracefully draw the curtains on this spellbinding episode of Winning Paths, the Battle of Agincourt, a rich narrative intricately woven with the threads of strategic brilliance and the clash of historical giants, has unfolded its captivating tale before our eager ears. As we bid adieu, I extend my sincerest appreciation for your noble company on this captivating odyssey through the corridors of time. History, resembling the weathered pages of an ancient manuscript, unfurls itself in the minutiae the resounding clash of armour, the stately dance upon waterlogged fields, and the intricate repercussions that reverberate across the ages. It transcends the realm of a mere saga, evolving into an epic that sculpts the destinies of nations. Should you find yourself enchanted by the scholarly scrutiny and pursuit of truth that winning paths ardently endeavours to provide, I entreat you to follow and join us on forthcoming expeditions. Unravel the enigmatic tapestry of the past, traverse the hallowed grounds of ancient battlefields, and immerse yourself in the subtleties that breathe life into history. Follow, stay engaged, 
and let the odyssey through the annals of history endure until the next time on Winning Paths.